<laughs> Let's play! Whoa! Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. You all may call me Pharaoh, and welcome back to another bonus episode of Let's Play Raging Loop. Uh, last time we left off, we went over Blackhead vs. Final Boss, which basically showed what Kiyonosuke and Rikakusan were up to after the whole incident. And, you know, of course, Rikako is still sulking, and she's gonna take a while to warm up, if ever, to Kiyonosuke, but... Events happened, and uh, hopefully maybe brought them closer somewhat. Now, we're going to go into the Rider vs. Mystery Station story. And apparently this is straight up horror. Hmm. Our interesting journalist eventually finds a mystery she didn't ask for. Can a wise boy save her from the her uh, heretical land illuminated by the light of madness? Oh, so this is a uh, Mamiya. Okay. Alright, let's see how it goes. Hi, Hosho de Gozaimas. Oh, Mamiya des Osewani not the Orimas. Mosia, Nanika Orimastaka? Yeah, Shimbu Mitemasga, Sotokarawa, Toto, Wakarizrai Kotonga, Okitara, Yatanato. So deska, Soreva, Nani Orides. Ma, Yoku Ari Kotodesio. なんとかストック使ったので原稿は落とさずに済みました。それでご用件はえうん。いえ、よく覚えておられましたね。私がそういうの昔書いてたって雑談。いえいえ、大丈夫です。うん。実はあります。心当たり。というか、私が通ってた
Her pride as a journalist didn't go beyond not writing lies and, contact, can, uh, and contacting the primary source herself. The other journalists seemed to be more about exposing the truth than defeating the media, and Hisako couldn't relate to that. Wasn't that just a facade? The desire to see things he shouldn't, the desire to laugh at others' misfortune, the desire to gain an advantage by knowing things no one else knew, the desire to take the moral high ground. Such desires were common to mankind, and wasn't journalism just a trade to present such products to the masses? They already violated laws and social norms to get new info. Didn't they have to put their lives on the line for their trade and work for the customers? If something wasn't going well, wasn't it because they weren't doing their jobs right? Forcing a self-deprecating smile, she drank some of her sh sh shoshu, and by the time it was time to leave, she emptied the whole bottle. With some of the others worrying about her, she parted ways with them. This wasn't enough for her to lose consciousness or con concentration. The only problem was that she didn't get to enjoy the floaty, languid feeling alcohol gave. Hisako hadn't enjoyed a good night out drinking for a while. She was so busy she had to refuse invites from her old friends and often ended up having to go to gatherings she didn't really enjoy. What kind of life was this? She chuckled to herself at that thought and then pushed it aside. It was a dangerous thought to have, to have when drunk. Shinjuku Station was like a maze. Making it, the, making it to the last train would be a challenge. If she didn't make it in time, she'd have to stay in the station. Hisako had tough nerves, but even she was adverse to the idea of sleeping drunk in the station. She remembered that there were lots of urban legends surrounding Shinjuku Station. There could be something inhuman causing uh, among the passers-by. There could be a cenotaph under the shoe line. There could be routes that took you somewhere you couldn't return from. Drunk as she was, she could maybe see one or two things that she couldn't see normally. However, she passed the ticket barrier, passed the platform, and got on the final train without encountering anything. With all the desk work she had to do, unless she was doing interviews, she could hardly go outside. And this time was taken up by a meeting with editors from a magazine company, participation in a press conference, and a drinking party. Even between all that, she'd taken out her mini laptop, made some drafts for stricter deadlines, and made a few calls. It was a productive day, even by her standards, but she'd have to spend all day tomorrow locked up in her room again. No matter how much she worked, her life didn't become any easier. It was a common problem, but it was also true that many such people often wasted their money on momentary pleasures, such as alcohol or gifts. Or girls, excuse me. She considered that maybe her payments would actually increase if she stopped considering her future and just lived as she wanted. Being on the verge of 30 made her somewhat uneasy. <laughs> she casually opened her phone and found out that she had over a dozen calls for each job. The job was so hard, yet the pay was so low. <laughs> she understood that there had to be a my before that, but she was still couldn't stop herself from complaining. If she couldn't gain money, she wanted to at least have an experience that you couldn't buy with money. In that sense, the incident of Fujiyoshi, where she was attacked by locals wearing wolf clothing, was quite special. However, it was dangerous and she didn't earn any money for it, so it was a loss overall. Incidentally, that was the first time she'd encountered someone who claimed to be a fan of her work. Haruaki Fusashi. Now, due to the danger he put her through, she wanted to know more about what happened there. They were still in touch via email, and she often tried to drag him in for an interview, but he always put it off, saying something about deadlines. He claimed to be a college or grad student, but was he struggling? Was he studying a very difficult, a uh, very difficult subject? It should have been summer break right now, so he shouldn't have. He should have had time, but it was not Hisako's turn to be busy. The circumstances weren't favorable, though she'd have some time after she crossed this mountain, so she had to plan her next job, whether or not it involved Haruaki. <laughs> Hisaka was always a curious person. She was born in Shinjo, uh, Shikoku and often interacted with stories of the 88 temples, 
uh, Gyubu Tanuki, and other mythical cultural aspects. She'd taken up uh, folkloristics in a college near her home. It was very interesting, and she could study it with passion. However, she'd never had the mythical encounter she'd always hoped for. She then went on to investigate urban legends and modern paranormal encounters. She'd even moved to Tokyo because she wanted to unravel the darkness of the city. She then got a job with a small magazine and was put in charge of the occult column, but it didn't go well, it didn't do well, and went out of business in less than a year. Hisako even felt that the sudden state of unemployment was the most paranormal moment in her life. She couldn't decide where to work next, was writing articles as if it were a part-time job, and eventually ended up freelancing. She was happy that she could feed herself, but she realized that this wouldn't keep going forever. Perhaps getting married would make her future more stable? <laughs> the people in the publishing and magazine companies were either other women or had families, while her old friends from her homeland were already getting married. She wasn't really interested in the other journalists, especially after that drinking party. Was she really? Well, okay. Yudai Hashimoto, the cameraman she briefly worked with, was someone she greatly respected. She was a man. He was a man of character, skill, and always looked at things with the eyes of a professional. The little consol consolation after party they had after the Fujiyoshi trip was actually the first time in a while she'd enjoy drinking with someone. She was so drunk he she even uh, aired her complaints about the other journalists. He responded with a flat expression. <laughs> よし、正義という I gotta say, I was not expecting that type of voice out of him, but okay. Even if some ideals seemed empty, losing them could bring about an endless hell. Hisako didn't know if that was Yudai's own take, but or if he was just playing along for a subculture-like idea. But she did feel that he was right. Though she'd have liked someone less horizontally challenged. I get the feeling, Mamiya. I, I get it. As someone who's also horizontally challenged. <laughs> Although I, I, mean, I am hard on myself. I mean, it's the type of jokes I make. And I try not making those jokes about myself, but I... I, I find it funny because I think I just very recently used horizontally challenged for something. And it's like, uh, all right, regardless. She didn't mind fatter or slimmer people, but someone on Udai's level is bound to cause physical trouble in various situations. She means sex. When she was little, Hisako was a daddy's girl. And so far, all the men she dated were older than her. She was entirely aware of her own electro complex and, and that it might have warped her eye of men. The inside of the train was almost completely silent. There were some other people in the car, but they were all sleeping on the seats. Many of them were as drunk as she was. She herself was half asleep, too. Whenever she closed her eyes, her thoughts became a mess and she almost leaked saliva from her mouth. 
It was a strange sensation. She was certain that she wasn't having a dream, but was somewhere between waking and sleep. Perhaps this feeling itself had been given had been had been given by a dream. A drunk person's senses had no stability or certainty. She couldn't sense the passage of time. She couldn't hear anything. She couldn't feel the shaking of the train. Drowsy as she was, she did notice how the train stopped and a female passenger got off into the darkness outside. Hisako's house was in Kawagoe. It was a 50-minute train ride away from Shinjuku, then 10 minutes on foot. She wouldn't know how to respond if someone asked her whether it was a good spot. There were far more potato fields than residences here. Or residences here. Uh, so it was a pretty dark out. It was pretty dark out due to the lack of streetlights. The place Hisako was renting was at the edge of such an area. The only reason she took it was a, well, it was, was a cheap rent and the fact that the area reminded her of her homeland. The dark night road was nearly empty. Of course, she'd never encountered anything paranormal on this path. The number of them had increased recently, and there were many signs warning about them. Apparently, they were, they were the types who exposed themselves to women, but as long as they weren't violent, they weren't a problem for Hisako. I'm for the fact you gotta have signs about it, I mean, I, I, it just seems like the town and the police should be doing more about it, right? I don't know. Uh, that thought made her realize that she was aging, which only made her more depressed. The fact that the most unusual things she could encounter after moving to the city were just some perverts made her feel really strange. Mm -hmm. She noticed someone walking in front of her. You can see lots of people walking at walking out at night in the heart of the city, but that was pretty rare here. Rare enough for it to be unusual. Masaka. Pervert? She felt that she had just imagined one into reality. No one else was here, and it looked like a man. It was easy to see him as suspicious. Normally, she'd have been more alert and have the good sense to switch to the other side of the road. However, she was more drunk than she'd realized. A pervert's diet. Garlic's effectiveness in fending off perverts. Uh, thinking of those and other, more indecent headlines, she took out her notepad. She was actually planning to interview the pervert. Hisako walked up and looked at him. He had luggage with him. Was he planning to pull something out? He wasn't wearing a coat. The man was wearing normal summertime clothing. And he was somewhat familiar. Um. Okay. That was her line. That was her line too. Hi. She suddenly remembered a call. She'd been contacted by Kiori Aribe, the woman in charge of the dining hall in Yazumizu, and someone she'd wanted to interview on May. The lady called to ask her something. Her son had come to Tokyo to visit colleges, but neither she nor him knew any good destinations, so she wondered if Hisako could help with that. When she was interviewing Kiyori about her, her Shishinari, Hisako had mentioned that she was studying f uh, folkloristics before. Apparently, her son had become interested in that recently. College students who knew what they wanted to learn before they even enrolled was rare, so any seminars would welcome passionate and skilled volunteers. This afternoon, they talked on the phone about it, agreeing on a new time. She was so busy that she missed most of the details, but Hisako was certain that she, ha she hadn't been told that the boy had already arrived in Tokyo. Her address wasn't on the business card she'd given them, and looking at his reaction, this meeting was surely just a coincidence. She could understand if it was closer to the metropolitan area. There were colleges there. Anyway, she didn't know of any local places where one could properly stay. Hisako could understand that the local rent prices were low, and there was a lot of industry and agriculture here. Yeah, 
いくら住所を確認してもつかないからもう諦めて適当にうろついていようと思って一晩中ええいやいやいやいやいや Wait, what kind of thinking was that? He seemed like an intelligent sort back in Yazumizu. Was that a misunderstanding? もうないか。タクシーはそう。もっと早い段階で手を打つとかできたでしょう。市外なら素泊まりでもいくつでも宿があったでしょうに。いえ、そもそもお金がないんです。それなら深夜カラオケとかビデオ屋とか、いや高校
いやその悪いですよこのままふらつかれる方が悪いいいから来なさいま間宮さん酔ってます酔ってない酔ってますって She was But even if she wasn't she would have surely done the same thing She was optimistic and proactive She would act before she had a chance to be embarrassed about it and worry about it later That was when the freelance writer、uh, Kyokyo Jose was like at the core まあ考えてみれば運が良かったわここで巡り合えて会えなかったらねあなたも困ったでしょうし今まさに困ってます何が困ってるのかな僕トイレかどこかに入ってますねそれダメマジダメざっと掃除するからそのためにはまずこのタイトなお外さなきゃとああ見えない見てない What the hell's going on? And frankly, I, I don't know why they go by two different names. Like,、uh, you know, Kyoko Jose and then, like, Mami. I, I, I don't know. They may have explained that. Maybe I forgot. But, because I always remember,、um, he, Hashimoto, he also always used to call her Kyu chan. I thought it was just like a nickname, which it is, but I think it's derivative from this name. Anyway. Hisako could remember fooling around like that, but then it was, then all went blank. She woke up with sunlight in her eyes. Her head felt heavy. It wasn't bad enough to be a hangover, but it wasn't pleasant. She was wearing her indoor clothes, and there were other clothes on other things <laughs> littered all about, but she didn't mind it. Where was he? She looked around her 12 to ta Tatami size room and found a note on a small table next to the wall. It was a message written in steady handwriting. It's time, so I'm leaving now. Thank you for the phone. I'll figure out how to use it and contact you when I have free time. Thank you so much for looking after me, too. Also, I didn't see anything yesterday. Honest. Yasunaga at eBay, which means he saw everything. She remembered that she l e n t him one of her personal phones. She had several, some for work, some for herself. He'd probably never used one before, but she was sure he would get by. It wasn't hard to begin with, and it had numbers on,、uh, of her other phones, so there would be no problems as long as he figured them out. Though, he was the type to spend the night outside if he couldn't find a place, so he could easily make, them, make some strange misunderstandings. What if he tried to put money in, in it and forgot to charge it? Hisako figured that it would, it, would be all, it would all work out. She fired herself up and stood up. She even,、uh, she even had more work than before, after all. They agreed that he'd come back once he was, he was done for the day. No matter what he did here, he couldn't get far without money. She would clean up the place before he returned. In the end, Hisako couldn't clean up the bathroom or bath last night, so she could only hope he didn't see them. Also, when looking at it realistically, she didn't find a reason to give him money to stay and eat at the hotel or something. She had no obligation to do that, and if she gave him too much money, he'd probably be hum so humble that it would be too painful for her. She already had him stay over once. Another day wouldn't hurt. He was a man, sure, but he was like a dozen years younger than her. If he was that sort to make some sort of mistake, he would, surely made it, he would have surely made it last night. It was a good idea to call his mother as proof if there, if there was nothing special happening here. She figured she would do it when he was around. If he would stay over again, she figured she had to prepare food for him. What though? Curry? Steak? Fried food? A 17 year old had to, be, had to be gluttonous, so the food had to be something substantial. <laughs> Maybe something weird yet extremely delicious. It was time for her to show off her knowledge as a critic of strange foods. Hisako would leave the boy awestruck with her excessive knowledge of ingredients and cooking methods. That meant that this was basically part of her job. Nothing personal. It would surely take more time and effort than just ordering something, but this was a matter of initiative. With that decided, she had to open up her afternoon for shopping, washing, and utensil preparation. 
Hisako had three articles to write today. It was nine right now. She overslept. Three articles in three hours? Uh, was that a joke? However, instead of giving up then and there, she removed the makeup that had been on her since yesterday and faced her desk without even changing into something. She felt like she could do it. <laughs> After breaking her speed, re uh, speed record writing up three articles, she faxed and mailed them to the clients. One was signed off, was signed off instantly, while two needed some minor changes, which she'd done in no time. She wrote those these uh, she wrote these out really fast, but that didn't damage the quality. In fact, one company even praised her. The the text had more oomph to it. Did something good happen? Good. <laughs> Hisaka was well aware that she was having fun right now. She showed her skill at the drinking parties she had of the girls in her college years, and she treated her previous partners to handmade food. But once she became employed, she had no longer had time for any of that. She might have been, have been more desperate for human contact than she realized. Did that mean that all her problems would be solved if she got married and made food for a hubby every day? That realization made her jump to her feet, and then sigh. She had no good person for that role, after all. With that, she now had half a day off, so she began cleaning and thinking of the menu. Come two o'clock, she put her makeup on and left. As she locked the door, the key showed under the sun within the clear sky. The weather was nice. Yasunaga hadn't contacted her yet. It could have simply been that he was busy, or because he actually didn't know how to use the phone. Even so, he should have been able to come back without a problem. A mountain child's sense of direction had to be good, surely. Thinking that, Hisaka went to the station. She passed a small station that echoed the announcements and entered on an old-looking car with a dull silver color. It wasn't the morning or evening rush hour, so there were few people both in the train and the platform. She casually sat down and rested. Since she needed both rare ingredients and, and kitchen utensils, she decided to get, go to a supermarket in the inner city. Hisako even made a note of what to get. If she finished within an hour, she was bound to return before the rush. She spent the next 40 minutes doing nothing. She would have loved to live her life spending half of her days working and half doing household activities. She enjoyed them. And she would have loved to have a gentle, reliable older man at her side to spend such days with. She remembered the faces of her previous partners. One was a sem senpai in her college club, one was a young employee in a, in a gastropub where she'd been a part-timer, and one was a senpai in her studies department. Was it supposed to be senpai? Like, you know, like, normally? Or uh, Why the hell do they spell it with an M? It might be something else, I have, I have no idea. The reason for breaking up was always the same. The man became bored of her. She could understand why. She wasn't the type of person a man would look for in a younger woman. She wasn't cute, was crude, had stern eyes, and was subculture focused. Dating her for a while was enjoyable, but a lifetime of her was too much. It was like her current job trying out delicacies. She knew that she'd messed up when, well, when picking up her a preferred kind of man. She would have probably fared better with someone the same age or younger. But wasn't it too late to struggle on that front? <laughs> Hisako decided to sleep for a bit. She'd been so energetic this morning that it was coming back to bite her. It, it could have been the alcohol too, so she figured she had to rest a bit. And if she slept, she wouldn't have to think about the ghosts of the past. So far, she did. She hadn't seen a single one of her ex-boyfriends in her dreams, and she wondered what it was, what it said about her. Thinking such familiar things, she closed her eyes. Surrounded by other visitors, 
Yasunaga was standing in the campus of one of the colleges he was visiting. He went through two colleges and probably participated in a total of four rele relevant events, such as open campus and simulated enrollment. It was rare for Yasunaga's own plans to, fa to fail. In that sense, this one was a particularly troublesome. The fact that he couldn't get, get to Takumi and Muro's family's home was one such pro failure. He couldn't find a residence he was told about no matter how hard he looked. One moment he thought he was walking around only to come out on a completely unfamiliar path. He asked the locals for directions but no matter how well he followed them, he just got more and more lost. He failed to find any public phones so he couldn't even call to ask for someone's help. When it became dark, he'd given up on trying to get there and arrived at the road he'd walked by in the morning. He couldn't understand what was up. Was it because the town was unfamiliar to him? Was that really it? I mean, it wasn't a coincidence. There was intent behind this. That time was a strange incident, incident which God appeared in Yazumizu. Even now, he couldn't help but believe that it was all done by human hands. After all, there was no god in the swirl who would send a poor resident of Yasumizu on a trip to Atami. There were many mysteries, such as the wolf guy's suicide or the collapse of the head families, but it was clear that there was some sort of conspiracy. And going on the trip had protected them uh, from its effects. They've been saved by a clearly human yet godlike person. When they come back, everyone in Kamafujiyoshi was shocked. There had been a mist, yet everyone was okay. Not only that, but they came back on a, on a limousine bus. Whatever happened there, life in Fushiyoshi had become easier since then. He could vaguely feel that their encounter with God was related to the fall of the village heads, and it was a turning point for everyone there. The difference in school life was the most striking. The students related to the village head related to the village heads had somehow vanished, and some had become friendlier with them. He always fell silent when asked, while Chigamochi joked around and Haru calmly dismissed everyone. But it wasn't just the people that changed. He could feel something else. The thing that had been oppressing them and vanished, and there was now uh, someone else who watched over them instead. He could feel it even now, when he was far away from Fujiyoshi. It wasn't unpleasant. He felt like he could keep calm and live with confidence. When the, was the mountain god telling him to give up on the exams in return? Haru had sent him off with a smile, so he really didn't think that was the case. She'd even sewn him a charm to keep him safe along the way and help him succeed in his studies. It was still in his bag, and he felt it, it would bring him good luck. It was the fact that he couldn't have bumped into her if he, had, he hadn't been outside, out, outside that late. Hisako Mamiya-san. She was an outsider to the isolated settlement of Yazumizu, and the first impression she gave off was that a, was that of a refined city lady. It was hard to be to become like her just by reading textbooks. Chi Mitsurazawa had gone to college in the city and also returned to refine so refined that he could hardly recognize her. As one who had feelings for her, he found it both charming and unfortunate. After all, he'd fallen for the animalistic Chiyomi he'd known since childhood. Even if that was still there, the people, especially the men, she met outside had slowly changed her. And by the way, when they returned from the uh, Atami, uh, Atami trip she, and she returned to college, she laughed and said she would go meet God. She probably knew that God and that smile could only mean that she... Yame, yame. Chimi had left Yasumizu and become free. Even if she was far away from him and it made him feel lonely, it was something to be glad about. He had to follow in her footsteps and become fr uh, become free himself. Switching gears, Yasunaga took out the phone again and called the addresses Me, Deadlines, and Me, Connections. It was just it just continued to ring and no one picked up. 
Was she asleep? It was already afternoon. Evening wasn't too far off. The rush in the morning had been awful. He can get he can get out somehow, but the whole place would be packed again when it, when it was time to return. He knew where he had to get off, but he wanted to avoid missing his stop and being unable to pay for travel again. He had to prioritize contacting Hisako. Upon deciding that, Yasunaga began killing time. After walking around for about 20 minutes, Yasunaga entered a college library. The old wooden interior was lined with countless bookshelves, and besides the sound of visitors turning pages, the place was completely quiet. According to the documents, this was the largest assortment of books in the area. Apparently, only school employees and students could borrow books, but everyone could hang around and read, so it was a perfect place to kill time. You could also use one of the dozens of computers to search for the right book or just find out more. Yasunaga knew TVs, but he'd never touched a computer. He figured he would need it in the future, though, so he certainly wanted to touch them. Also, a book from a hands-on learning experience left him intrigued, so he wanted to know more. It was a textbook about ruin excavation. Before, he'd wanted to become a lawyer to earn lots of money for his mother, but he'd been changing recently. His mother, Kiyori Aribe, and Takumi Muro had begun to seriously consider getting married. She'd probably start to enjoy living Yasumisu a lot more than before. Thus, she insisted that Yasunaga and his brother do whatever they wanted. About a month ago, Kiyonosuke Nasato, who'd left Fujiyoshi, had sent Yasunaga a sealed envelope. Inside, there was a letter and a photo of God's mask. He wrote that he had the thing with him, but if Yasumisu wanted to prepare a proper place for it, he would return it to them. The Nasato document said that a certain someone had dug, dug it up from Yasumisu. Kinosuke had no affinity for this kind of thing for himself, but if Yasunaga was interested, he would contact his family and have them help him. Yasunaga had been captivated by the possibilities the letter, the letter provided, as well as the shape of the mysterious mask displayed in the photo. He knew that studies were about looking for reasons and results. If there was a reason, uh, if there was a reason, there was a result. So by knowing the reason, you can know the result. And by analyzing the result, you can arrive at the reason. As results and reasons switch places, things that had and didn't have a shape would switch places and create unexpected value. Yasunaga found this extremely interesting. That was why he enjoyed learning and why results followed him. Through the mock exams, he found out that he could easily be top of his class in college. The path of a lawyer was open to him. However, he was enchanted by the wolf mask. He wanted to know who made it and why, and the reasons why it had so many similarities to the Mountain Festival wolf costumes and face cloths. What methods would be involved in finding that out? Such questions made him extremely excited. This reminded him that Hisako had, had said she would re recommend him to folklorist seminars. He would, if he chose to go there, Hisako would become his senpai. He had a few more questions about it, so he would stay at her place again. He wasn't sure if she'd allow that, but he wanted to talk. Last night, she'd fallen asleep in an indecent position, and he couldn't even ask her anything. He remembered how she'd turn around and... He shook the memory off. It was best to act like he hadn't seen anything. Yasunaga was quite perplexed by the difference between her usual self and her and her when she was drunk. Mamiya-san. She didn't seem older than him, but still far from old. As he thought such things, he realized something. He might have a thing for un unprincipled older ladies. No, it's not, Yasunaga. <laughs> Let it wash over you, buddy. He failed to get Chimi, so he would go for Hisako? Ah, oh, that would be too simple. Straightforward and hasty. Instead, Focus on the library. He tried calling her on the phone again, but the result was the same. Yasunaga sighed, put the phone away, and entered the library. She regained consciousness, but couldn't properly process reality yet. On the surface, it looked like everything was normal. She couldn't realize that there was no conformity in her awareness and that something was really off. 
It was night. Outside the train car was pure darkness, and the lights inside only seemed to emphasize it. Hisako Mamiya instantly assumed that she was riding on a late night train, returning from work that tired her so much she'd fallen asleep on the ride. She clung to that story for a few seconds, but as her thoughts became more clear, she became more pale. Has she slept too long? Has she been sleeping here for a whole few hours? What happened to Yasunaga Aribe? She abandoned a boy who needed her help. Oh, what a horrible thing to do. Hisako quickly dug into her bag. The two phones she had she had both said it was for uh, the two phones she had both said it was four minutes past midnight and that there was no mixed missed calls or texts. Not only that, but both of them had said that they were out of service range. Out of range? On a train line? She then realized another thing. This wasn't a loop line. If she'd overslept, she would have been awakened and kicked out. Even if that didn't happen, she would have been caught up in a rush. No way she could have slept she could have kept sleeping then. In that case, what was happening here? She naturally assumed the reverse, i.e. that her meeting with Yasunaga was just a dream. She'd gotten drunk, got on the last train, and that was when reality ended. She began having a dream where she met Yasunaga Aribe and let him stay over. That wouldn't explain everything. She didn't have her personal phone with her. Unless she dropped it somewhere, she lended it to Yasunaga. Then there was a shopping list where she made. It was hard to argue that she'd made it while sleeping. She definitely got on a daytime train and had somehow arrived here. A train with no one else but her. Something wasn't right. Hisako finally realized that she was on an innat she was in an in unnatural situation. Basically, something paranormal. Unlike a certain swindling author, when faced with the paranormal, normal people felt only fear. <laughs> She licked her lips. Hisako had been dreaming of seeing something paranormal her whole life. Even though she knew by now that there were always just people behind the curtain, she'd still chase the darkness. And this time, she'd finally gotten what she wanted. She'd been waiting for this for long and she was ready. She prepared and put, on, put up a front. It was time for her to show off her skills as an exocult writer. She stood up. Her car was the fourth. The same as when, as when she got on. It, it looked like a normal train if you ignore that there were no other passengers. Hisako moved through the car and opened a the door. There was a soft curtain wriggling at the connection, and it seemed to visualize the loud but organized sounds and vibrations. The train was still running. To the third car, all was the same. To the second car. Ooh, oh, that doesn't look all the same. It looks like Silent Hill. All was the same. Oh, oh, wasn't all the same? Wait, chair's still running. Wait, what's going on? To the first car. Hello, game? Uh. It's all the same. What, what's going on? It's looping. My, my, my game's broken. The, the first car was the front. Hisako covered her mouth. Even though she hadn't eaten much since morning, she was hungry. In fact, she felt an intense urge to vomit. As she went onward, she became aware that there was some sort of anomaly that affected her nervous system. Her thoughts became dull and her paralyzed sense of danger made her unable to realize it. Her physical condition was just getting worse and worse. Urge to vomit, headache. She finally realized that something was even more wrong than she thought. Lack of oxygen? Orderless gas? The journalist who looked into cases of carbon-based carbon suicide had told her that carbon monoxide poisoning made people fall asleep and just die. <laughs> there had to be someone at the front. The train wouldn't be moving otherwise. Hoping for help, Hisako staggered up over her head. She felt like she could fall at the slightest curve. How long would his train keep moving forward? Upon arriving at the front, she looked through the window into the conductor's seat. There was no one there. Or rather, she couldn't perceive it. The part of the scenery where the, uh, through the window where the driver should be, should be seemed to be cut out. 
She couldn't see it as if she was actually blind to just that part. Though, it didn't look like there was something there. It was probably worse. That place itself just didn't exist. Basically, it was a space that rejected the laws of the physical world. Something fatal for human perception. She quickly looked away. Her vision returned, but... The car wasn't the same as before. It looked like it had been left underwater for half a century. There was rust, tears, or tears, and rot everywhere. The doors were dirty, the seats were torn, the walls had eroded, and the windows were covered in dirt. However, none of that could compare to the advertisements hanging here and there. After all, they weren't in Japanese. It wasn't the alphabet or Hangul either, nor was it Hebrew or Arabic either. The text seemed like warped, heretical, evil hieroglyphs that could, that could have been created by human hand. It made her realize that she'd been seeing them for a while, but only found them suspicious now. Yeah. <laughs> Hisako's courage was quickly overwhelmed by fear and panic. Those who only knew wild beasts from zoos didn't know the fear of being inside those cages. The fear filling her throat and crawling up her skin was just too great to resist. However, she could overcome it just enough to create a goal, goal for herself. Escape. She had to get out. With only that thought in mind, she closed it on a nearby door. Above her, there was a rustic metallic cover uh, hiding an emergency lever. The instructions on it were written in some cryptic hieroglyphs, so she looked away. For a moment, she almost felt like they extended like tentacles and wrapped around her fing fing uh, fingers. Can't say fingers, apparently. She forcefully opened the cover, moaning because of the tearing pain in her hand, and pulled the rusty lever. There was an alarm. She knew it because of what she, what she did, but she felt like it was a scream of the train-shaped yokai. With a high-pitched yet wet, annoying, lowly, belittling, insulting sound, the train began to slow down. <laughs> Sounds like that dude from Killer7 if you guys ever play that game. A train broadcast? It was a male voice. It sounded somewhat monotone and sleepy, just like the train. She couldn't understand a word of what it said. Unable to bear it, she finally vomited, but even then she didn't let it go out let it go she didn't let go of the emergency lever. Her fist turned pale from how hard she held it. Hurry. Hurry up and stop. Hoping for just that, she directed her cloudy eyes into the darkness outside, where she saw a white, square, luminous object. It was a station name. A station name in a Japanese language. It was there for just a moment, but she read it. The next moment, the train shook. Hisako almost fell and the train stopped. The door opened up. Upon realizing that, she noticed that the other train cars were as clean as she remembered. But she couldn't trust her senses anymore. Breathing raggedly, she made her way outside. The voice from before followed her. Well, that was close. She couldn't see the outside well, but she realized that only a small part of Frick's first car was next to the platform. If she walked out any other car, she would have fallen on the tracks. Feeling hard concrete on her knees, she tried to stabilize her breathing, which was which was when her surroundings became dark. <laughs> the bright lights from the train had vanished. She turned around and saw the train, lying there like the corpse of a large beast with its jaws hanging open. It still made some mechanical sounds, but she felt like it would fall completely silent soon, like a cadaver. She didn't know why the train had to shut down right after an emergency stop, she didn't even know if there was a reason. Once her breathing stabilized, she stood up. There were no light sources anywhere. She concluded that there was a platform because of the sign she'd just seen from inside. Ignoring that, there was just a concrete ramp. Even empty stations had night lights. What was this place? <laughs> She already had info, however. 
The station's name was Kisagari, and it was in it was in Haragana. It fit the Japanese announcement she heard. Uh, Kisaragi wasn't a station she knew. It still didn't look like a proper train platform. But if it wasn't that, then what? <laughs> but she quickly remembered that there was no guarantee that this was supernatural. Looking back at all the phenomenon so far, it was likely that this was just an illusion. This was some station late at night, and she was just incapable of acknowledging anyone else here. However, she had to act based on what her eyes told her. All the horror characters who thought they were insane that were, fa were fated to die. She needed light, so she took out her phone. And when she did so, something made her widen her eyes. The battery was almost empty. How? It could last two days without charging, and it was relatively new. <laughs> She concluded upon leaving, looking at the other phone. It ran out of battery even faster, but it somehow it had more than the other. And both of them were out of service range. She thought she escaped trouble when she left the train, but that idea was shallow. Maybe it would have been better to stay, to just stay in the fourth car? Yeah, mada wakaranai. It was best to believe that something was, was wrong, but it was best to avoid extreme assumptions. She figured she had to look around a bit more. She took the phone with more battery left and lifted it up. The weak light illuminated the platform and a rusty fence. There was nothing but a dense hedge around it, and there was, and there was no way to tell what was further. She directed the light up. There was a roof, a really small one like ones used in the bus stops. It was also aged, but not as much as the train. There had been a schedule on the support here, but it was torn off, apparently. She looked at the text and numbers that were still there. It was no doubt Japanese. Was this actually an abandoned station? She lit up the rails. It was a one-sided platform, and beyond the rails there was nothing but a grassy cliff. Further in, there was a ticket booth in a small, station-like building. She thought that she saw a dim light around it, or beyond it. As her eyes got used to the dark, she could finally differentiate between a dimly lit, cloudy sky, the lights in her hands, and the lights outside. Inside. There was something there. The station sign, perhaps? Hisako walked by the ticket gate and directed her light to the other side. Darkness. Or rather, the outside was so vast that the backlight couldn't reach, couldn't reach it. That meant that she could leave. There, was no wonders, there were no wonders at the ticket booth. It'd be too scary if there were. No workers, I should say. She shook her head, went forward, and looked inside the station building through the broken window. There was no one inside. There was a mess, but it didn't look like there was any, anything significant there. It looked like it had been abandoned for a thorough move. Nothing more, nothing less. All that was left now was finding out what that light was. She expected to find a station sign, but she was actually found beyond the what well, what she actually found beyond the building surprised her. It was a vending machine. Coffee, fruit, juice, sports drinks, green tea. For some reason, most were warm and there were even brands she knew well. Hisako sighed in relief. Finally, she came across a piece of the civilization that she knew. At the same time, she became hungry and thirsty, and the puking had given her such a sore throat and stomach. Additionally, it was also summer. The air around her was warm, and the tension had made her sweat a lot. She wanted to drink some water. She took out a hundred yen from the wall in her bag and put it in the machine. She pressed on the button for the mineral water, and it fell to the tray. Hisako stuck her hand in and felt the cold of the bottle. It was the standard European hard water. She opened it and brought it to her mouth. At that moment, she wondered what had happened to her caution from before. She didn't know about what this place was. It could have been exactly like that train. There was no better time to question her senses than now. So why did she choose to drink something from here? She knew better than a usual person. 
that eating the food from a different world was an expression of willingness to become a bride of that world and reject the old one. Before her throat could enjoy the water, she threw away the bottle and vomited again. With that, she was assaulted by a powerful dizziness and headache. She spat and spat and tried to keep herself together. Then she looked at the vending machine. It was no longer just that. It was a gathering of creeping vines on a stone wall. The leaves were all bigger than an arm and she could see it clearly now, for it shone. It was a white clo it was it was a white closer to blue. It was a beautiful blue hot flame casting a light you could only see in places like nuclear reactors. It brought about destructive energy that didn't allow life. It propagated and diffused and spread maliciously. The plant bore fruit. Hisako unhesitantly looked at the gel-like fruit, colored a malicious blue and filthy red. One of them was right next to her feet and its fruit juice was spread out on a granite floor-like floor she was standing on. She just ingested the juice of the fruit from a plant that, had, that was not from her world. She spit it out, though. Or did she? The surroundings no longer tried to hide their evil nature. The building was exactly the same as before. However, the base material had become granite. It was covered in the same cryptic hieroglyphs as she'd seen in a train, and it made her scream a little. The train was now all rusty and rotten, just like the interior of the first car was. It was like a metal ship that had washed ashore. It used to symbolize the defeat of the human mind, or the victory of the evil lurking there. <laughs> Struggling to keep her footing, she looked for a proof that she wasn't going insane. However, that hope was shattered when she saw her phone screen. It showed only static, a field of unintelligible black and white. Everything besides her was going insane. No, even her own things were like this. How can she make sense of this? She couldn't even look at a mirror now. Though panicking again, she couldn't throw away her phones. They were her only weapon, after all. She worked the phone as best as she could. She even tried to do something on the other, almost dead phone. She wanted to connect to somebody. Anybody. Contact button, up and down buttons, call button, no luck. She couldn't connect no matter how hard she tried, but that didn't stop her. The small bit of rationality she had left told her it was pointless, but she repeated it regardless, for she had nothing else. He was calling Isako every 20 minutes or so, but he had no luck with either, either of her phones. It was close to evening now, so it was best for him to return by himself. Certain she couldn't answer, he called the... Me Deadline's phone. Having no luck there, he then tried to call the Me Connections, knowing it was pointless. Normally, there was a ringtone followed by an announcement that the target phone wasn't in service range, but there was nothing. No call sound, no voice, nothing. Curious, y Yasunaga Moshi Moshi. said that. There was no response. Mamiya san desu ka? Boku desu. He said what he wanted. Suddenly, It was a voice he shouldn't have heard there. With the wolf killing incident, he found out that Haru Makashima's game wasn't just an act. He hadn't seen her act like that, like that himself since that time, but Chikamochi might have. However, Yasunaka knew that this entity was someone to be revered and loved. Anyway, she was too poor to have a phone, and so there was probably there was absolutely no way he could have called her. What a strange response. Kisamo 
様がそこから声がするのは自然じゃと思っておられるからじゃ。The explanation was a bit convoluted, but he understood it. 科学的には説明のつかないことが起きてるんですね。何か象徴や意味が大事になるような。さすが貴様は頭がおよろしいの。あの町のお方のようじゃ。欲しいことをしたかなえー、っととにかくじゃすぐに電話を切りなされえそれじゃあ話せなくなるでしょう全言撤回貴様はタコじゃ何ですかそれは本当に電話をしておるわけではないんじゃから切れても話せると申しておるいいから切らぬか死ぬぞ He understood that she was telling him he was in a bad situation and quickly hung up 押しましたよきかなどういう意味なんです死ぬってもう安心してよろしいぞ説明してほしいです小難しい説明は苦手じゃそこをなんとか貴様先ほどどこかに電話をかけたじゃろう。通じぬほど遠い相手に。かけました。He was confused by the so far you cannot reach them part, but he nodded. Hisako's house wasn't far away, and phones didn't usually mind distance that much. It wasn't an international call or anything. 遠き点一つと近き点二つが、たまたま時を同じくして呼び合った。坂巻にねじり合う三角の結界をなした本来交わりがたき二つの世でも点が三つあれば結界をなすひどく無作法で不全なる回ですがもう故にそれは読みの無事なを呼び込む God's words were too hard even for him to understand But he did remember that God had once be,、uh, been called a Mujina, Mujina, a badger. So, I don't know what I'm saying. I'm not sure 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 what I'm ようございましたな、我がおって。He really didn't feel like he'd escape some sort of danger. However, God's roundabout words were enough for him to learn a certain truth. A distant point and two points that were, that were near. If standing on a triangle made by, by this was dangerous, it meant that Yosnaga was standing on it too. Were the two other points the phones Hisako had? Mamiya san wa ima. そんな遠くにいるんですかタコにもいないいかにも神様山の神様でしょ熱海のお刺身いい意味じゃったの食いしん坊発揮してる場合じゃないだろハルちゃん間宮さんはどこにいるんです物理法則が効かないくらい遠くってじゃからその名で呼ぶな気が散るしかしまあよくよくお分かりじゃの神の奥ゆかしさも台無しじゃその女は煉獄におる That word wasn't in his vernacular He instantly turned around With an empty expression, Yasunaga walked up to a PC in the library and awakened it from its sleep. He turned on the browser, accessed the search site, and typed in Purgatory. Since the ruin excavation book he wanted to read was being lent to an American school, he spent his time here reading a technical guide and using a PC. As a result, he'd, he'd already come to understand computer inter interfaces, networks, the relevant base concepts, and how to use them. He looked at the search results and opened the purgatory entry on a dictionary. He 
He talked into the inaction phone again. そして夢を違うとも言えましょうな。どうしてそんな。神隠しなど昔は珍しいものをございましたぞ。今は昔じゃありません。人を欺き、角を明かす神もおりますれば、そういった神ほど恐ろしく人の住む場所に紛れ、高滑に
Kita. Yasunaga had already logged in as Yasu and repeatedly pressed the refresh button. Upon seeing the new person join, he raised his voice. But the person who logged in was called Okeg. Was it a glitch? Did the phone display it wrong? But at that moment... Help. A short yet heavy message was displayed. What kind of place are you in? Kisaragi Station? I looked it up, but it doesn't seem to exist. It probably just looks like a station. Don't let it fool you. I know. I can feel that I'm in a weird place. I sometimes can't even tell what's real or what's not. It's bad. I can't even remember my name. Masina. He talked to God about this about uh, about this while preparing, and that got him a warning from the librarian. <laughs> they would take the phone away if he used it again. He had to be careful about using it, but he had more or less already found out what he had to do. It was bad because of the warnings that God had given him. Don't drink or eat anything in the other world. Don't forget your own name. Don't turn around if chased. You are Hisako Mamiya, son. Hisako Mamiya. Say it and remember it. Hisako Mamiya. Yeah, that's me. Thanks. Don't eat anything. I almost ate a weird fruit. What? Are you okay? I spat it out. Was that good enough? What if just a bit of it was fatal? But then again, if she didn't actually accept it, maybe it was just fine. It was probably a question of mentality. Tell me what Kisaragi Station is like. It took a while for her to respond. There's a single set of rails. No workers. It's all dark and cloudy. There's a vending machine. The train stopped nearby. I got here by going to Tokyo. After I bought some water at the vending machine and almost drank it before spitting it out, everything changed and it became like this warped, weird temple. Then it started feeling sick. It happened on a train, too. It became a mess and I saw weird text. Apparently, these places change depending on the observer. It's the concepts that matter. Why do you know so much about this? I'll tell you once you're back. We need to focus on the situation. You're in, you're in purgatory. All places where God exists can be escaped. Huh? Where's Virgil? Where's Beatrice? And going to God means dying, doesn't it? Holy crap, is that a Dante's Inferno reference? Wow. I, I personally have not read uh, uh, the series of books. Uh, and I know there's the video game Dante's Inferno. Till this day, I really wish they either did like a remaster or a remake or a port of that game because I only played the demo of it and it was insane. It was awesome. It, it, it Granted, it was called, it was basically a, what people like to call a God of War clone, but the demo opened up with you killing death. I mean, holy crap. And I, I, I've not really seen LPs or footage of the game like beyond it, but I heard some pretty awesome things about it. But yeah, that's a game that that needs to come back. And frankly, I don't know who developed it. I totally forgot. I'm gonna look that up after after I'm done recording here. He did understand what she was talking about, so he looked it up. Ah, there it is. It was from a classical work called The Divine Comedy. He was impressed by how knowledgeable she was. Dante's Inferno being one of the books, um, because I I believe one talks about hell, one talks about heaven, and I don't know, did one of them talk about purgatory and limbo? I, I think, maybe. Either way, that's out there. I'll lead you through it. It's possible to save you if I, if I can get there. Trust me. I don't really get it, but okay. You also might be imagining that you don't feel so good. Try lighting a fire to feel better. I don't have a lighter, and I can handle this for now. Okay. Well, now, I had this idea. If Purgatory is between Heaven and Hell, shouldn't they, shouldn't they be the previous or the latter stations? I see. Good idea. But I don't know where I got on this Hell Heaven tour. I don't know the details, but it does seem like things got, would get worse if you kept writing, right? It did. It might have been a train to Hell. Then maybe you should try heading back to the previous station. The train doesn't work, right? Right, but I don't want to ride it again anyway. Can you follow the rails on foot? Can I really trust you? 
I'm not 100% certain. Tell me if there's any new info. All right. I just saw the moon. Now, just so you know, it's six in the evening here. You're joking. Is the flow of time different there? That's not what I mean. This is bad. What is? Please respond. She really did see the moon. There was a space in the clouds covering the sky, and a reddish moon peeked through it. It was, its, it was in its first quarter, a half moon. Though it wasn't bright, it had a powerful presence and seemed to shine over uh, at the platform. She just realized. The strange, unknown structure she couldn't see in the darkness had been right on top of the station. For a moment, it seemed like a light hanging strangely high. But that was no light source. It was a giant lens that gathered the moonlight. There were also metal mirrors around, and they all occasionally released a light akin to the moon's. They were probably there to help the lens gather moonlight through focused reflection. It moved despite there being no wind. The more immediate problem was the fact that the unnatural device focused the moonlight into a ray of light that created a red dot on Hisako's chest. The redness filled her with fear, but then she jumped back, feeling that she was being targeted on purpose. It was like a moment from a movie where a vile sniper trained their laser sight on a protagonist. The light didn't follow Hisako. Instead, it went away from her on the and, and the platform to target the train. Suddenly, like a bit of ice melting under a laser, the train lost its false appearance. The new-looking train instantly became a crumbling, rusty wreck. And then, it finally exposed its true form. She instinctively knew that the new appearance wasn't harmless to the sane world of men she knew. That moonlight was no light of judgment, and the moon was not the moon she knew. It was the evil moon of the different realm. Its power was to return things to the true forms. That was the light of the device. For a moment, below the pillars supporting the lens, she thought she was a silhouette, which was either a small human or a gigantic uh, amphibian. She, she no longer was in a situation where her eyes could be trusted. The train had began to melt into a soft, transparent, yet still metallic material, and had a chemofluorescence, the anomalous quality of the fruits. Uh, wait, is, is this like an actual image that's going to be new? I think it looks... weird. If Hasako had any knowledge in developmental biology, she would have compared it to the cellular change that happened during uh, differentiation, which took place during the start of life of, or regeneration. Her impression of the event was more straightforward. It looked like a pupa going through metamorphosis. What was, what was once a train was now standing. It was an extremely large beast. From head to toe, it had become a transparent body that could support its own immense flesh and bone. The white, slimy skin quickly became a red-purple-colored uh, geloid that spread throughout. Th uh, breaking through the bark-like material and spewing lots of mucus, the object grew branches, legs of multiple joints. They were small compared to its body, but they had numbers. It grew more and more of these legs. And once it was done with that, the creature looked like a screw pine she had just seen in Okinawa. She felt like a... Mo she felt like a malicious, heretical caricature of the strange tree that grew countless roots. That probably wasn't the best comparison. The thing was by no means a peaceful plant. This was a vile, gluttonous animal that lived only to eat and reproduce. Partially on reflex, she ended a summary, uh, recorded a summary of her thoughts on her phone. Even though the extreme fear and shock had numbed her mind, she was well trained enough to pull that off. She looked down and saw the phone vibrate just before it started working. It run out of battery. Hisako could no longer get help. She had to handle this herself. Her goal was to return, and for that she had to go to God, which required her to move and run away from the grayish pillar of flesh with comb-like teeth. It was even puking something. After looking at it, she realized something. With the train gone, she could see something that she lost sight of before. It was a station sign. It glowed white like a lamp and could see the see the hara, uh, haragana for Kisaragi from there just fine. 
She jumped off the platform, landed with all her limbs, and began running, ignoring the pain of the impact. She could hear thuds behind her as something soft was peeped out of the floor, but she couldn't observe it. Following the rail, running on the rocks, she hurried to the station sign. It looked like this. Kisiaragi. To the left, Katatsu. To the right, Darkness. Looking at how the train went, she'd, she'd come from Katasu and traveled towards darkness. However, this left her confused. Katasu? Kisaragi? Darkness? What was that? Did Katasu refer to Nino, Kata, Nino Ka, Katasu Kuni? The world in Japanese myth that had the heavens. Uh, Takamagahara, the netherworld. Yomino Kuni, and this world. Uh, Ashihara na, Nakatsukuni. Nino Katsukuni, also known as Nino Kuni, had been the place where Isanagi and Sasonio lived. Due to various circumstances, such as the root part of it, it ended up being considered to be the same place of Yomino Kuni. Kuni. The afterlife, basically. Hell. Was Katasu hell? But if that was the case, darkness would be heaven. But she barely knew any myths where darkness was good. <laughs> She began running and couldn't stop now. Where did she where did she have to head? She was attacked by the unpleasant feeling again. Of course she would be. The sign had now displayed those disgusting hieroglyphs. She had no idea what it meant now, and behind her Oh dear. The monster had begun to seem beautiful and lovable to her. That was a mother. A mother beyond all bonds and blood, and an incarnation of motherhood that had manifested here in this world. All that she birthed, uh, all that she birthed would be consumed by her, then birthed again. It was an honor and a joy. Ew! But look at that thing. Like, is it meant to be pregnant too? Like, ugh. The anomaly, still covered in transparent gelatin had somehow retained a human form. It was summoning Hisako, welcoming her. She would embrace the child with those wet hands and summon her into reincarnation and the greatest pleasures. She almost felt like crying. She wanted to take off her clothing and be purified by the Great Mother, embraced by all. Even so, she could bear it. She successfully endured it. After all, she knew. Her discovery made her laugh in a strained, maddened manner. The puzzle she had in her head had finally been solved. Yasunaga-kun's hint was necessary, but his direction was off. Purgatory. Rengoku. Lang. She wasn't Dante, but Randolph Carter. Kisiaragi meant moon-like. That meant that it was a place to gather and use power from the distant moon of illusion. The moon's power had been prepared to open up a route to, into the great darkness. It was the pinnacle of the madness involved in connecting to a device from a universe that rejected the laws of physics. It looked like this simply because she was Japanese and, and a modern person. The place was basically a kind of hell wrapped in Hisako's imagination. But... But... If you recognize that... If you acknowledge the Necronomicon... Carter, Dreamland, Lang, Plateau, Shub, Rath, Cthulhu? If you realize that many mysterious stories left by H.P. Lovecraft could manifest as a real threat, then didn't that mean this world was on the verge of ending? And if, and if that mattered to her, as if that mattered to her, Hisaka was an adult. She knew how to pick out things that were good for her and turn a blind eye to the contradictions and survive in a way that was in, that was in no way fair. The Hisako who knew the truth would, could ignore the fear it inspired to deal with the immediate threat. That barely made sense, but it made her pull herself together. She had no reason to hesitate any further. Her, her destination wasn't the Nino Katsuno, Katsuno Kuni. It was something hidden in there. Katasu. Kadath Station. <laughs> as far as she knew, this was a challenge. 
It was a place where few could find themselves. She didn't even know if normal people could live there. However, if the something that had led her there, she had a good guess about its identity, had made such a human-like trap, that getting there should be easy. After all, the rules had already been written. But that was when she was assaulted by the worst spell of dizziness and nausea yet. It nearly brought her to her, brought her, to her knees. If she staggered around like this, everyone would catch her. She now understood why Yasunaga had suggested she light a fire, but she wasn't in a situation where she could even do that. Would the other phone burn if she shorted its battery? <laughs> what a pointless thought. The phone had a roll to fill. In that case, she would use her minimal mythical knowledge to create a small fire. She opened her notepad, clenched the ball pen and ink to it, linked to it, and struck it against the granite floor, at the edge of the stone with wriggling marks of, all evil, uh, of evil all over it. The metallic ball instantly broke, but she didn't mind as long as it lasted long enough for her to finish. It would hold meaning even, even if made like this, surely. Line, corner, line, line, corner, line. Watching the transparent creature approaching her, she felt her intellect become overwhelmed by fear and panic, but she still pressed on. This was how it was supposed to look like. A warped pentagram, or a tree-like symbol of divinity. In the middle of it, there was a figure akin to an eye and a flame. It wasn't a powerful weapon. If there was something better, this world would have surely been saved from the fear of Cthulhu by now. It would surely hold no meaning against the Great Mother approaching her. But there was still, there were still its children, the, un the unnatural air here, and the entity controlling the moon lens. It could maybe work on them. She finished carving the Elder Sign. The next moment, the world screamed. It didn't actually deal much damage to the realm itself. However, even a simple needle could bring severe pain if used well. It was especially damaging to those who didn't expect such a real retaliation. With a rending sound, things changed. First, it was the air. Perhaps not permanently, but it, it felt purified. Second, those chasing her writhed and faltered. The Great Mother behind them shook as if enraged and continued birthing more children. Now was the time. Now was the time to run. She sprinted. I'm going to Katatsu Station. The second phone's about to run on battery too, and I won't be able to contact you again. I trust you. Hisako had logged in, logged in after... Oh, Kick had logged out because the first phone's battery had run out. After that message, no amount of refreshing the web, web chat page added anything new. A while later, Hisako was logged out. No longer having any business with the empty chat page, Yasunaga cleared a browser. After that, he placed the phone next to his ear. With just that, he closed the phone. As if to escape the librarian advancing in his direction with furrowed eyebrows, Yasunaga logged off the PC and left. There was nothing more he would do he could do besides believe in them. Hisako ran. She ran along the train tracks, illuminated by a sinister moonlight. Her legs often got caught in the railroad ties, and she fell a lot. Her high heels were broken, but being barefooted would have, would have made things even harder. Her feet hurt so much that she could barely feel her toes. She couldn't keep the tears from her eyes. Eventually, all she could do was stagger forward, but even so, she couldn't stop. She had an urge to look back, but she actually thought she had to. For all she knew, she might have lost them completely. However, she knew better than the average person that turning around in such situations was a big mistake. Thus, she just continued walking. She wished to return to the boy who was worried sick about her. She would give her thanks, as well as make him some eccentric yet delicious food. With just that in mind, she continued walking. That, this might have continued for about an hour or two, uh, maybe even longer. She continued walking, looking at only her legs. She walked. <laughs> if someone hadn't called out to her, she wouldn't, have been, she wouldn't even realize that she'd already re reached her destination. She was now at a shabby, dark station, much like the previous one. The sign there said Katatsu. This place was... <laughs> 
called once again, she looked to her left. There was a concrete platform within reach. And on it, there was a child. A silhouette of a child with cheap looking kimono and bobbed hair. The child's voice was androgynous and not very articulate. The moon was hidden now, and the only sources of light were the sky and a sign. Hisako couldn't see the child's face. The voice was innocent but a bit strict and harsh as well. The child gave Hisako a hand. She, however, merely stared at it. It was so close that she couldn't see past the hand's shadow. A dark child. Could it be that? The sudden girlish voice made both Hisako and the child turn its face, uh, turn to face its source. There was a strange looking figure near the ticket gate. She was clad in bandages and looked about 16 or 17. With that, Hisako instantly knew who she had to trust. That was the song that Chimi Sarazawa had taught her back in Fujiyoshi. Ignoring the child, she ran to the platform, climbed up, and hid behind the girl. That was no longer a child's voice. It wasn't even human. The child had been replaced by a vortex of darkness that looked somewhat humanoid. However, that wasn't true darkness. It was a chaos that consumed all, even light. For a moment, Hisako thought she'd seen three shining spots on its face, but she instantly looked away. If this thing wanted to, it could have prevented her from doing that. It could even crush her sanity completely. That was just how big of a deal this thing was. これから行く旅邪魔をするのかもう次はせぬそうだねお前はあの場所で我に囲まわれていた弱々しき神のはずだもの狼や蛇に睨まれて言いなりになっていた弱い弱い弱い神だもの立てつくことなどできるはずがない それでも我は落ち戻ったそうだねだからこっちにも戻ってこないで山の中でじっとしていてごしょうじゃふーん許そうありがたい橋本雄大を代わりにしようか久坂は almost stopped breathing why would that name come up here there was no reason to ask. She knew it all. That was Hisako's line. However, she didn't have the guts to talk back against this dark, crawling chaos. The unnerving girl turned around to the ticket gates. It was hard to see, but there was a silhouette there. It was a very old man. But why did it seem like there was a dagger in his throat?
闇が好きなんでしょうこれからたくさん見せてあげるよ。約束が違う糧にならぬというならば、せめて我が慰みとなるがよし。おのが命運の細く短き様を嘆きつつ、それを伸ばさんとして醜くあがき続けるがよし。神は試練を与えるもの。そうだよね、お姉ちゃん。She couldn't say anything back. それで身の程を知れ。承知した。行くぞ、女。The girl dragged her. Past the old man who struggled for breath and out of the station into a dark road. As Yosunaga stood alone in the campus without purpose, the cell phone he'd, been, he'd borrowed rang. It made him jump. It was a call from a public phone. Could it be that? Mosh Mosh? Atashi, Mami ya Hisako. Buji de Shaka, Ima doko desu? Buji cha buji kana. 一応五体満足だけど、死ぬほど疲れた。今どこです自宅ですか奥多摩。えなんかすごい山の中に放り出された。あとは何とかしろって。織部君とこの神様、シビアすぎないま、まあ、でも、いい神様ですよ。そうみたいね。ちょっと遭難しかけただけで、人里を出られたし。タクシー乗り継いで帰る。タクシーですかとんでもない値段になるんじゃ。もう電車には当分乗りたくないの。もっともですね。とにかく、迎えに行きます。安全な場所で休んでいてください。Three hours later. A taxi approached the Okotoma bench Hisako Mamiya had been idling on. Mamiya san! The young man who got off instantly ran over to her. Her whisper made her realize just how tired as she was. However, there were no signs at all of the falling and vomiting she did in Kisiyaragi Station. Her high heels were okay too, and the ball pen was unbroken. Her cell phones were still charged as well. Buji de yokata d e s By this, she met the experience itself, and the fact that she'd escaped from that being. もうもんなしになっちゃいました。She sighed, remembering that the boy was the definition of penniless. It was a valid problem to have, but it didn't make her feel good. She staggered a bit as she got up, but it was only due to her walk down the mountain and mental fatigue. Perhaps she'd even lost several of her sanity points. The thing had said it would show her even more darkness. She wanted to brush it off as a joke, like it only said that to a menace and ridicule her. That was the kind of being that it was. To the eyes, Kairoka. Eh, Dosimas Ekinishiro, Chokonishiro, Daijo, but that the Untenshi san, I temaskedo. Then Shavana Bokuga Mihateo Itagemasio. The words caught Hisako off guard. So then, I'll eat Kosira. まあその電車の方が楽だしんどうしたんです She was just having a moment of weakness. This boy was really dependable, but he really wasn't her type. Hell, he was underage too, and a lot younger than her. He'd be a crime. あそうだすみませんが近いうちに休みずに来てもらえますかどうしてなんかうちの神様が。マミヤさんを助けるためにいろいろあったらしくてあ僕に渡したお守りだけじゃちょっと心もとないからちゃんといろいろするとかなんとか That reminded Hisako that she'd become her follower なんか変な儀式とかあるのかしらいや今はもうないですよ
やっぱり興味あるな君の村もうちょい調べさせてもらえない一応学芸員の資格はあるんだけどあそれで思い出した大学紹介の件ですけどああそうかそうかって四国まで車で行くのって大丈夫明日の日程が終わったら夜のうちに出てとか僕は大丈夫ですけどんじゃあそれでアポ取っておこうかしらその足で四国行って帰る足で富士吉村それなら君も楽だろうしというか明日も送迎してあげるわよ一応軽だけど車はあるからえそんなにしていただいたら悪いですよ<笑>いいのいいの今日する予定だった買い出しもする予定だし And she didn't want to be alone. So, let's go. 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 Yasunaga began to have trouble putting his thoughts into words, which made his sako tilt her head. どうしたの神様が最後にちょろっと言ってたんですけどね。消えさせるには、その、およ、んんい、いや、なんでもないです。ちゃんと別の方法を用意してもらえるよう頼んでおいたんで、大丈夫です。Seeing the boy turn beat red, she felt that he really was still a child. She found it charming, and it was a perfectly healthy impression to have. To any cuck, you go, ka, untensu san matter she. So this ne. Octamaka. Ekino chikakuni, sugoku, oishi, ramen yagaru, te kita kara, so kode kyo wa tabeoka. Sasuga pro no joho this ne. Demo, o kanega. Inochi no onjin ni wa ogoru wa yo, tozen. So na. Te imasara ka. じゃあすみませんごちそうになります They got into the taxi and as Hisako listened to Yasunaga give directions to the driver she finally relaxed She was resolved to feed him her own food tomorrow That sentiment was even stronger than it was this afternoon but that was because they, she, he saved her life surely They the, then go to Sh Shikoku it, wasn't, it wouldn't be just a drive but a real trip And then they visit his home What a packed schedule. She was excited, tense, and strangely uneasy about it. She'd always yearned to experience something blatant, uh, blatantly occult and paranormal, but now she knew it was something to enjoy from a distance. Hisako suddenly wanted to see that informant, Haruaki Fusashi, again. That insolent man had gone through a mistress she hadn't, and she felt she could bond with him over their strange experiences. It was high time she made an appointment with him, so she resolved to make one at all costs. So, yeba, Mamiya san. As the driver began taking them to the station, Yasunaga took something and gave it to Hisako. Nani? Shashi? Eh. Yasumizu no iseki kara deta mono rashi des. Hito bashira ni natta, mukashi no kata no ibutsu da toka. Konna bunka, doko ni mo mita koto nai kara, sugoku i kenkyu tema ni naru nja nai katte o moun des kedo. Mamiya-san? This... I was the God of God. I don't know. Yes. This... I was the God of God. Well... 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 She felt like she'd just seen a whole new face to the world. The beast mark... The beast mask with the three red eyes carved on it made Hasako think of the darkness looming ahead of her, causing her to feel lethargic and look up at the taxi ceiling. End. Whoo! Okay. That one took a lot longer than I thought. That took like two hours. I'm worried that the other remaining ones are gonna take even longer. Like, literally, like, the, the, the way these went. Like, the first one took like 40 minutes. This took like an hour and 20. This took like almost two hours. And I can only imagine how the hell these are gonna be like. I mean, this was very interesting. I'm still freaking confused about it. Like, why... Like, why did it even happen? 
Why do they... I mean, I understand that Hisako says she always wanted to see the occult. Well, she got it. You know, I, I guess it's like a be careful what you wish for. Okay, and perfect. Those were the CGIs. The, uh, or CGs I was missing. Okay. About that monster and the... Uh, the great mother, I guess. Well, I guess that means we're not going to get any for the remaining two, so... There's that, and it basically confirms that we're not going to get any uh, any other CGs from the Revelation scenes. So, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be it for today's episode. That that was a lot. Um, it was cool. It was actually kind of, like, freaky. And, uh... Pr probably my favorite out of three so far. So... We'll have to see how Boy and Girl versus In From Hell is next time. So... As usual, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you all next time for another bonus episode of Let's Play Raging Loop. Love you all so much. Have a great day.